Brian and Cameron with NC Beer Guys. Welcome to another episode of the NC Beer Buzz. We have come back to Fortnite Brewing Company, Fortnite Brewery and Pub. We're here in Cary with one of the uh, vision meisters, the guy who had the dream, and he brought in some co-founders and some, uh, some money people along the way, and Stuart Arnold is here, and he is the face of the brewery. He's one of the guys who most of us think he owns it all, but he'll be quick to tell you he's got a lot of help behind him, a lot of support behind him too. So we're back in Fortnite. We want to talk, we've been here before when they were brand new and tried to make sure our people knew about Fortnite Brewing, but we've done a lot of changes at Fortnite. We want to come back and let Stuart walk us through some of the changes in the last, has it been two years yet? February 2014 we opened. Okay, so, so two and a piece two and now. And a half right, right. Years, yeah. But it's come on strong and so many changes, I mean, you've got to be overwhelmed. Yeah, it's been a fantastic ride up to now. That's great, because yeah, you, yes. you never can know, you can have all the right vision, all the right plans, and a great location, and frankly, uh, a good financial situation come to start, but you don't know what's going to hit and what's not going to hit. You, you set off with a plan, and then in this industry that you know has gone on a roller coaster ride over the last mm -hmm. two and a half years since we've been over, sure. um, the, we've had to turn around on a dime, I think, like you Americans like to say. That's right. We, we started off just as a production brewery uh, aiming to go into bars and restaurants, just winning over tap space, but mm -hmm. that, that war became harder and harder. Sure, with, I mean, all the fighting breweries. for tap space is a tough way to go. Uh, yeah, you, you get a, you get one six stall on there in one week, and then it's gone the next. Mm -hmm. And we quickly quickly realized that if we wanted to make an impact on the market, we probably have to change strategy. Uh, and so that's when I went back to my shareholders and said, it's probably going to be better to focus on the retail segment at the moment, given that we've got the space mm -hmm. uh, and a, bit, a little bit of money behind us. So that's when we we didn't have it last time when you were here, but we're now canning. Right. Uh, and we started to focus on that market, but we have all started, we, have, we started to refocus back on the tap market as well with a different strategy. Okay. And we've done a lot of upgrades to the tap area, the bar, the, the pub area here since, well, we've seen it because we're in every once in a while. But tell us about the evolution of the tap area, the front of the business. Well, going back to the business plan, when we first wrote the business plan, we, we wrote it based on a lot of existing breweries in the area, and they were just based in 7,500 square feet. Mm -hmm. And the tap space was often an afterthought, frankly. Exactly. And they were, on, they were in industrial complexes, and they just wanted to make an impact with the, um, the commercial brewing world. But we, we quickly came to realize, or I, I came to realize, as I was writing the business plan that uh, some of the most successful breweries out of the gate were the ones that were relying on a tap room space and it's a long story and this probably take a whole other video but instead of focusing on the uh, industrial complex we we kind of fell into this place it, we were very fortunate to fall into this place and it's not an industrial complex it's on a, a, a main thoroughfare mm -hmm. or well, minor drive yeah, or minor road it's on a main we thoroughfare so uh, we, we realized that we could use this to um, kind of get a start and then focus on the, the commercial side mm -hmm. of it so yeah when we first opened it was just four walls concrete very echoey very industrial looking uh, and, and as we started to um, develop the space we wanted to make it a little bit more homely because we weren't on an industrial complex and mm. we were getting and because we weren't on an industrial complex we were getting people coming in and saying oh this is just four walls right and it really shouldn't be because we're on main and uh -huh. road in the middle uh -huh. of the care right they expected and more exactly and, and so now we've kind of transformed it to have a little bit of an old English feel as um, if Dave pans around you'll see the kind of stuff that we do and we're now getting a lot of people coming in and saying, oh, wow, this is kind of really nice for Kerry. It's fun for us to watch people that have been coming for the first time and walk through the door and right. say, oh, this is it's not nice. just a warehouse. That's right. Yeah. So let's talk about what have you done in the area re in, in recent, recently. In, in the tap room itself? Yes. Well, the first thing we've done is we've given uh, We've gone from six to eight tap handles, whatever it was. I can't remember that we just drilled mm -hmm. through holes in the wall. Right. And, and we've made a, I think it's a 16 tap system that we have now. 
And I think last time you were in, we had four beer engines, and you, and you know what my stance is on that's right. Cask beer. That's right. I don't need to go into that again. But we had no. But it's important for you because it's part of who you guys are. Yes, it's part of our identity, and it was part of my mission to um, bring true cask ale to America. Yes, you and can. to educate the local drinkers on what that even meant. Yeah, I, I hate saying the word educate. It sounds a little bit patronizing. Yeah, but, but I'm not it's, sure it's <laughs> wrong because a whole lot of people that drink, even the craft beer drinkers. Yeah. Yeah. didn't know about a cask engine and pulling beer right out of the cask. Coming coming from England, where I spent 40 years on and off, I, I was used to cask beer, and cask beer was just the, the you know, the, the re-fermented stuff that came out of the, 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 the fermentations from the primary, and it creates a totally different beer. And what I was seeing when I came over here to the States was that people were just taking a beer and adding um, adjunct ingredients to it, really from marshmallows to mm-hmm. rhinoceros <laughs> Trunks. Whatever, right. I don't know what it was. And that's just not the way I wanted to do it. I wanted it to be completely traditional. The only thing that we add to our casks are hops. Mm-hmm. And, and we take great joy in showing people around the brewery on the tours that this is this is a kegged ESB, for example, and this is a cask ESB. But it actually came from the same brew day. And if you can't tell that the those beers are two completely different beers, beers are, even though they're the same, mm-hmm. then you know you need to go back and get your taste buds checked at your doctor's right. or dentist right. or something right. like that. Because there is a very so, much of a difference, not only absolutely. in presentation, but in taste. The whole, they're, they're a flavor, aroma, right. presentation, like you say, yeah. And we just had the full when we opened and we couldn't keep up. We would, quite often we would just have one on because we don't have the luxury of a cellar here like mm-hmm. we do in the UK, so we had to recreate cellar conditions sure. with the refrigerators set to cellar temperatures. Mm-hmm. And as you can see now, we've extended to seven, <clears throat> and <clears throat> we still struggle to keep them fully stocked. That's how right. popular we've become. But part of that problem is also you have hit very well on the commercial side. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and, that, and that's a great problem to have. <clears throat> yeah. Commercially, it's... Um, from the commercial production sense, yeah, we're, we're growing at a rate that none of us forecast. Because at first, your your mission, in somewhat, was kind of to be the local, to make sure the locals knew about Fortnite, yeah. and a fairly narrow swath across the county or across the Piedmont or wherever. But you didn't have any vision then of going as far as you've gone now. No. No, it was slowly, slowly, let's do an organic kind of growth kind sure. of thing. Yeah. And, 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 and the market drove you otherwise? The, um, yeah, it was demand. That's all it was. Uh, the demand, demand, demand for the keg beer is, and the canned beer has exceeded our expectations, as I mentioned. We're getting more and more requests for cask beer to go out to account. Because more people are figuring out they can also put the cask handles on, pull, but they've got, they don't have the, the capacity to produce their own cask beer. Absolutely. And everybody doesn't offer that on the marketplace. No, they don't. Um, and my, the, the next phase of my um, cask plan, if you like, is I would love to introduce some kind of cask program to bars, restaurants and pubs where we actually go in and show them how to look after a cask. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not difficult, but you, you need, But it's unknown. You need a little bit of instruction mm-hmm. to do it, to make sure that it's served correctly. Because before now, it's often been a novelty if they had it at all. Yes. They had one yes. handle. Yes, yes. It's definitely been a novelty, and it's not been traditional cask. And I'm not knocking any breweries that don't do traditional casks here. Well, it's what you do, but that doesn't mean it's for everybody. Exactly. I, I, I get why people want to try cask with this, that, and the other. I just want to show them that uh, you can take the same beer and make it taste completely mm-hmm. different just by treating it differently. Sure. But yes, it does take a little bit of um, tender loving care to put a, a cask on and serve right. it directly. When we first were in, the, uh, the property was different too. You've expanded greatly in two years. You've taken over next door. Mm-hmm. The parking lot is extended. Yes. And you've got a little picnic area, outdoor area. Yes. That all was part of the original vision or it kind of was a dream? It was. No, okay. no, no, it was you, always... You knew that might... It was always part of the strategy. It was always there in the, the back of my mind and it was always on the to-do list but there was always a lot of things higher on the mm-hmm. to-do list and, and, the, and there still are. Sure. Um, we, the first thing, you know, was getting this nice and, and done and expanding, uh, making sure that the quality and the consistency was there in the brewery. But yeah, we... Um, 
we parking was always an issue here when this place gets full then the parking used to get full that mm -hmm. we had so we built a, an access road that enables us to um, park some vehicles when we when we get uh, quite full but the, the next stage and, and this is not going to happen overnight the, the next stage is like you mentioned we own the property next door too it would be nice to turn that into an event space and into a traditional English beer garden too but mm -hmm. it's going to take time negotiating sure. all the you know reg rules and regulations in the town uh, and, and we are in care so that'll particularly That'll present its own particular challenges, of course. And if you guys don't, who, who know Kerry, perhaps, and know Fortnite on Maynard, he's referencing the property that's on the corner, which was a veterinary hospital or a vet's office, right? That's what that Doggy was. daycare or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah, even what it was. Yeah, but that's yeah. the property on the corner of, of Chatham and Maynard. Yes, Chatham and Maynard. Where, it's, where, it's where we are. Yeah. We're one building off of that now yes now finally one thing that you told me a while back because we ran a big event here a huge event and it was a little loud in this area you talked about quieting it down and yeah. some noise dampeners mm -hmm. and you've done some of that already we have. I think you've got some more plans to do some more let's talk about that so what we did so when it was concrete walls you could have 20 people in here and it was the, 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 the noise just used to get louder and louder and louder because one person would talk over another talk mm -hmm. over another talk over another and it would bounce off the walls and concrete floor <laughs> right and stuff like that and, it, and we always had trouble uh, regulating the temperature in here because it was concrete uh, so what we did is we bought some super thick insulation it must have been kind of like this thick we put the insulation on the wall and we also got some acoustic soundboard as well mm -hmm. so we put that on there and it, it helped it worked somewhat it still wasn't perfect right. so then what we decided to do was um, where Dave's filming right now there's a there's a rug on a raised stage that we've built also mm -hmm. this is where we have people performing on a, a Friday and a Saturday evening uh, sometimes we've also got some uh, an old tobacco box uh, to Dave's left over there that's uh, absorbing some of the sound and we also have, if you look around us the, the St. George Cross that you see there and the, the fortnight behind Dave and then the, the red panels on the wall are actually professional sound absorbing panels so they absorb so, sound so they're all helping towards it uh, if that doesn't work completely we'll find out next time we get really full and there's plans for it, lowering a fault, putting a fault ceiling in there with some dampening. Okay. And maybe putting some more rugs down on the concrete floor too. But it's a 100% improvement on what it used. And just looking up now, I realize, I think there's new light fixtures or am I wrong? Some new light fixtures. Okay. The, the ones that they look a little more like they belong here. Well, yeah, the, so the ones that you can see that look like hospital lights or warehouse <laughs> industrial lights. Industrial lights, right. Industrial lights, and that's exactly what they are. Uh, we had to put those in to pass, I believe it or not, some kind of Wake County health code. Okay. We had to be a certain brightness in mm -hmm. here to to be able to serve in glass, not and in make plastic. Sure you, make sure the glass were clean. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, yes. whatever, that, yeah. whatever that means. It was so that people could see into corners when they <laughs> so were cleaning. That's exactly so what it was. Right. But now that we've got these, these won't disappear. Right, these, but they can go down at These time. we can turn down, and, and as you can see, we've got a lot of reclaimed lighting, and we actually have six more to put in. Okay. That's just going to be in the next few weeks. And that'll certainly add to the ambiance. It does add to the ambiance. And right now, it looks real bright and, and loud, but what we'll do is, and that's because you guys are filming, what we'll do is we'll actually turn the lighting down and it gives it a bit more of a, an atmosphere. And the bulbs that we've, we're putting into these um, these older ones, especially you can see the one, I know the viewers can't see it, but behind you there we've got the old Edison mm -hmm. type bulbs in yeah. there, but they're LED, so they look Edison, mm -hmm. but they look... Uh, but they're modern and efficient so at the same time. And efficient, but they do the trick, they look fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So we've caught up with the front side of the business, now we're going to go talk to... Uh, Derek Garman, who's the head brewer here, about what's going on in the backside of it is in the last couple of years. So we moved back on the backside now to the hearts and brains of the whole matter here at Fortnite. And Derek Garman, the head brewmaster here, is joining us. And Derek's been here a while, and he's really got a reputation going here. And we're just so pleased with what he's doing. And, and of course, Stuart is, speaks so highly of Derek. So first, let's talk about one of the brand new things we're doing here. So we uh, we picked up canning. Um, so we, we try to can everything that we can. Uh, this is our canning line that you see right here behind us. And um, we we got it uh, almost about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, came down from uh, from Canada, from Cast Canning Systems. Okay. And it's been a phenomenal machine. This thing does anywhere from 25 to 30 cans a minute. Um, there was still a little bit of manual labor. Uh, we've I got to say, which is not a huge canning line. No, it's not right. a huge canning line. Right. Um, 
But in the in the grand scheme of things, we can do a thirty barrel batch usually in about six to eight hours. Mm -hmm. So it's not slow either. Right. Uh, right. And it, like I said, it's still a little bit manual. Uh, we have to pull the cans on ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, the the pack techs, the the casings that hold the beer cans together, we we have to snap those on by hand. Right. Manual load pallets. Uh, grab stuff one like back there and show our people what you're talking about. Yeah. So. Right. So, so this is just uh, one of our cans. Um, so each one of these has to be manually loaded in our cage. And you load them by pallets and, at a oh, time. Oh, yeah. Big, giant pallets. Into this cage, right. Yep. And we had to build a cage because we actually had some problems with uh, someone, and I won't mention names, but it was me. Um, <laughs> it was you. Knock, knocking over pallets of cans. Don't so. knock stuff over. That's right. Well, That's right. you got to remember, a pallet of cans is probably about three, four grand. And empty cans, will, they're not very heavy. They will knock over. They will knock over very easy. And the other problem is, is with the lid ridge right here, if there's any kind of imperfection in there, it, it won't, won't seal, seal properly. Um, so big so cans don't, aren't good. Any can that touches the floor is just garbage at that point. Are we canning everything? We're not canning everything. Okay. Um, we do some imperial ranges, we do some seasonals, and we haven't started to put those in cans yet. All right. uh, our core lineup, which is the Blonde, the ESB, the Expat IPA, and the Coffee Amber, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the Porter and the English Ale, will all go into cans. Okay. Um, and those are it for right now. Uh, we do have some other stuff that we do cans, our 95X Double IPA. Um, and we have another beer that's going to be coming out. Uh, we, they we're, uh, we're doing an experiment with music, and uh, that will be okay. a, part of, a part of the canning run. So I don't well. know about 95X. Let's talk about that. What, so, is, what is this? This is 95X, the radio station here. Yeah, so 95X is the alternative radio station here, and they, uh, they approached us... I want to say about March or April of this year, and said, we want to do a beer with you guys. We want our own beer. We brand. want our own beer, um, which was really, really cool. Um, so we, we, uh, we, they said, all they gave us was, we want a double IPA. So we, they, they said, play around with it, do whatever you want. We want a double IPA. Mm -hmm. uh, so we ended up doing this creation. Uh, actually, I've got uh, a team of guys that I work with now. And uh, so David McComas is one of our other brewers here. Yep. I let him fly the reins on this one. So uh -huh. it's 9.5% or 9 .5 alcohol, 95 IBUs. Oh, 9.5 for 95, 9.5% alcohol. Yep, 95 IBUs. 95 which, IBUs, which is a little on the bitter side, but it is a double IPA. It is a double IPA, but it's also got a little bit of malt sweetness to it. So yeah. it's not overpoweringly bitter. It's still approachable. You're still gonna get that nice bitter, uh, you know, bitter flavors, you're going to get some uh, some grapefruit and some piney notes, um, but it's not anything that's overpowering. It's still pretty approachable from every angle, which is kind well, of great. something that we're real happy to do. 95X here. must be, I mean, be so satisfied with this. That's they, great. They were real happy. We released it at Brugaloo this year, uh, uh -huh. and they, they got to try it for the first time. And they didn't leave the tent for the rest of the night. And it's so, not only in cans. It's uh, uh, it's oh, also in kegs. Kegs, okay. Um, we haven't done any casks of it just because I'm a little hesitant to, to right, do casks. Right, see what it's going to be but, like. Uh, but, yeah, mostly in cans, uh, all statewide. So I want to reference back something that Stuart told us in the front of the video about the cask program mm -hmm. and the fact that there are some things that you can only get here in the brewery. Yeah. Um, so a lot of our imperial range, uh, some things that we play around with, we've done a, a, a chai amber, which is an amber ale that we infused with uh, uh, masala chai. Um, it was a big back and forth because here in America we think of chai as you know cinnamon, mm -hmm. and nutmeg, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, but Actually, the rest of the world considers chai as just any kind of tea, uh, or they call it char. Right. So we were thinking, well, yes, we could do a chai and we could do all these different teas, and, um, but there's a lot of people that won't get it because they expect chai to taste like one thing. Chai so, tea, right. So that's why we did it. Um, so things like that, you'll only be able to find here or special events. Um, most of our beers, we've got 16 taps, and I want to say seven of them are beers you can find anywhere, and the other nine are beers you can only find here or at special events. And you do have also cask beer that you put out for the commercial market. We Well, it goes out a little bit. Uh, a lot of our cask stays in house. We go through, on average, about four to five firkins a week. Okay. So just to give you an idea, and our firkins are actually Just over, here? Just here. And right. our firkins are actually oversized. The usual firkin is 10.8 mm -hmm. gallons. Uh, most of our firkins are 12 gallons. Okay. So we're going through almost 60 gallons of cask beer a week here in house. So there's not that much to put out in the market. There's not that much to put out, but there are places that are taking it. Um, there's uh, a couple of Bricks Pizzerias that have hand poles mm -hmm. that they put them on tap. Uh, Flying Saucer takes them from time to time. Uh, cask beer is is really starting to pick up, and so for the past two years, it's really been our mission to make cask beer 
everything that it's supposed to be. And it's also, I want our viewers to understand this, a cast beer is not always the same beer that you've seen made in the traditional way, but it's also a different beer. It, it does turn into a different beer. But it can um, also be a different it beer. Can also be it may not be something that you could get in any other way. Yeah. So when you see it out in your favorite drinking hole, you might want to try that because you'll have something that maybe nobody else has had exactly. or none of your buddies have had. So that'll be a, a great check-in for you on Untapped. <laughs> um, and, but we do things a little bit differently. A lot of, a lot of people do casks different ways. Um, we do a little bit more traditional on our cask. So the only ingredients that we put in our casks are the beer, the Isinglass, the, um, the yeast, priming sugar, and occasionally dry hopping it. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do, go too crazy with the casks. And it's been about a two and a half year process, but we can actually get the casks almost crystal clear uh, within about 30 minutes. If so, Stewart's not judging. If Stewart's not judging. Well, if Stewart is judging, there's been a couple times. That's a law of camera joke we heard before. Stewart is very, very critical of our casks. And, his, and, his and he should be. He, he's, he's the he's, quality control. Exactly. And he knows casks better than anybody else. He spent 30 years in England. Sure. Um, but we've had, uh, over the past month and a half, I can take a cask from the back put it up front in our cascarator, tap it, get everything set up, and just pull a pint through just to already. clear the lines, and it's ready to go. And I give it to him, I show him, hey, this is what I got, uh -huh. and it's usually within 30 minutes, it's beautiful. For, because, for you guys who don't know, often people think about cast beers as being cloudy or unfiltered, of course, and with stuff in it. Mm -hmm. It's not as clean as some of us like to drink more clean looking beer. Yeah. That's what a target is. And, and a lot of that is, is people are still learning. Um, I, I, when I came here two years ago, I didn't know how to really do cask. Mm -hmm. And I was able to tag into some brewers who had studied in England, who knew what they were doing. Uh, and then Stuart saying, no, you need to make it clear. No, you need to do this. And then figuring out the rest of the way on my own. Right. But it's, it's taken me two years to get a cask to drop in about 30 minutes. But the whole Fortnite place has come so far in two years. Can you even imagine when you even came in the door? You might have known the vision, but where it's come to is amazing. Where it's come to is incredibly impressive. Um, you know, I didn't think that we would be statewide by now. I didn't think that we would be pushing out as much beer as we are. Um, and recently we won a couple of medals. Let's get our kudos in. <laughs> Yeah, we did win uh, two medals. Uh, we won uh, for the U.S. Open. We won a silver medal for our blonde and a bronze medal for our ESB. Uh, and there were 5,000 beers entered into the competition, uh, and we, we took home two of them, um, which we're really, really happy about. And it was great. A lot of Triangle Area breweries brought home really, really good medals, and a lot of them, too. Um, so it was, it was good to be a part of that. But that all. feels good to get those rewards from your peers and from others I mean, who, who recognize what you're doing. Yeah, it, it feels really good. And I, I'd never enter into a competition expecting to win. As a matter of fact, I entered in the competition and I just assumed that I'm going to lose. So it's, <laughs> it, it's a really nice feeling to, to wake up and look at the email and go, oh, wow, I actually won something. <laughs> I won something. <laughs> uh, but GABF is coming up, so that's the next big one. And, right. and we've got to put our best beer forward and, of and try to represent North Carolina out there, too. That's great. Uh, Fortnite has done such great things. We're so proud. We're so pleased that you've done well. well thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for it. having us on the backside. So now you know all you need to know about the new Fortnite. It's come a long way in two and a half years, not even two and a half yet. So until next time, this is David Glenn reminding you to drink local and keep your beer dollars in North Carolina.